women reinvest 90% of their income back into their families and communities. And it's that level of, um, of, of investment back into their families that really makes a difference. And then we have so many stories about what happens when women get that money and how it really changes generationally. Threads Worldwide was something that you started about 10 years ago. It's been a decade now since you've been working on this. And it started off as a side hustle. Mm -hmm. So how did you develop a passion for Threads Worldwide? And what is it, first of all? Yeah. So what we do is what we are is we create work with women in eight countries and um, I, I would actually say nine because women here in the U.S. work with us to create the work around the world. Um, and everything that we sell is fair trade. So we have fair trade jewelry. That's our main staple. Then we have home goods and we have handbags as well. And um, and the model that we use is called direct sales. So women can come on as, as, like, as a side hustle. Everyone's looking for a side hustle these days and earn an income by creating impact and work with women around the world. So that's what we are, who we are. And then how I developed this passion is I've, I've traveled a lot. I've been really fortunate and it's also been just a major priority of mine to travel. And um, I've been to 56 countries around the world. And I did that through quitting jobs, taking sabbaticals, whatever it was that I needed to do to be able to travel. And it was on these travels that I would be a lot of times with my two best friends that I started with. And we would be sitting in a coffee shop and, you know, we always joke that we were like, we were just killing time between meals. When you travel, there's not so much to do. And so we would be sitting in the coffee shops dreaming about how we could work together and thinking about a bunch of ideas that we could do. And luckily, none of them worked out before Threads Worldwide. Um, but it was really this on these trips that we would look and we would see we'd see all of these beautiful things that people made. And then the way that they were living was just not correlate. They had so much talent and yet such a small market and limited market tourists selling to tourists. And so we thought, well, if we could connect this amazing talent to a strong market here in the U S it could really make a difference. And it could be a really fun way for women here to create community by joining in and doing it all with us. One thing I like about Threads Worldwide is that you created it with your friends, which I think is amazing through traveling um, or by traveling, traveling all over the world kind of sparked the idea within and you guys were able to create, which I think is amazing. Um, I'm also fascinated by people who travel the world because I do think it's very important for people to travel as much as possible because you get to immerse yourself in different cultures. You get to see how people are living all over the world and it just gives you a new found perspective. So I'm, I'm curious to know what were some of the things that you kind of learned or what are some values or insights or aha moments that you kind of picked up along your journey through these 56 different countries that you've traveled to so far? Yes. What a good question. I, let's see. Um, I think the thing I'll start with what I learned about myself is that I really like myself most when I'm traveling, when I'm in travel mode, there's no agenda. There's no deadlines. I mean, maybe it's catch a flight, catch a train, but that's it. And so everything I, I find myself coming into situations with pure curiosity and where if I'm standing in a checkout line in Denver and somebody's taking too long, I get frustrated when I'm standing in a checkout line in, you know, Hanoi, Vietnam, and somebody's taking too long. I'm interested in what, what's happening. I wonder what they're talking about. Cause obviously I don't speak Vietnamese and what is their money like and what interesting things they have on the shelves and what interesting footwear people are wearing. I mean, all of the things, there's just time to really be in awe and be in wonder. And it's something I work on here in my day to day. And it just comes so naturally when I'm traveling 
which is one of the things that I love and I've discovered while traveling. Um, and then just the way that people, you know, um, the things, the thing, the, the way that people greet each other. I mean, just the day to day elements I find so intriguing. Um, the way that they celebrate different um, events. Like we were speaking of Vietnam, we were in Vietnam and um, it was the new year. And I mean, it was, I don't know, it was 20 years ago or so, so I can't remember exactly, but it seemingly was a five to six week holiday where everybody was off. They were on different schedules for everything. There was the, the regular schedule and then there's the new year schedule and just this appreciation for oh, wow, really celebrating life, celebrating the new year, celebrating everything, you know, just in, being together with family. And when in the U.S. do we ever stop for five or six weeks? Uh, I, I can't think of a time. And so that's something else that I find interesting is to see how people relate to time, uh, relate to celebration and gathering and getting together. Um, just every aspect when I'm out of the country is is fascinating to me. Yeah, something I've learned in the little travel that I've done, I, I'd hope to travel more, is that people are a lot more patient in general um, overseas and really take time to be more present and enjoy life and celebrate life in a way that I just don't think it's the same in the U.S. Can't speak for every state within the U.S., but we have this go, 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 go mentality. Whereas in a lot of different countries, it's pause, enjoy, celebrate, be in the present, which is something that I really, really appreciate. So I, I'm glad that you brought that up. And it really takes something, you know, if you compare it to food or something, it's, it's hard to eat foods that don't have preservatives here. It's hard to eat healthy, just naturally, like the, what we have at our fingertips it's so easily is fast food that comes with preservatives and all of that. And in other countries, they just don't have that. They go to the grocery store daily because their bread will rot. You know, I've found more, I'm a mom of two and more than once I found a string cheese at the bottom of my bag in perfect condition that it's actually grosser to me to find it in perfect condition than to find it all moldy, which is what you would expect and hope of food that you're giving your kids. So just like that with, with, with health here, it's the same to, it's hard to get out of the culture of go and I work at least 40 hours a week and I only have two days a weekend and, and I only have two, two weeks a month. And even when I'm taking my vacation, I'm still really on and it's, it's hard. And it's something that I'm working on and really taking on this year. Well, I've been taking on really for the last, but I'd say almost two years, but I'm even leaning into it more in 2024 because my gosh, especially my kids, they're growing up and, and I do not want to miss it for even for something as passionate as I am about threads. I still have the rest of life to, to savor. Yeah. You know, something I want to ask you, cause I I'm curious about this. I know you have a background in psychology and something people always say when they travel overseas is that although in the U.S. it seems like we have a lot more resources, no place is perfect, obviously, but although in the U.S. it seems like we have a lot of resources, people describe people that they're observing in other countries while they travel as having better mental health. Have you observed that as well? Do you think that there's some truth to that? You know, I don't know if I have had that lens anecdotally when I'm traveling, I'm like, like, sorry, if I, I didn't say that sentence right, but I don't know if I've had that lens and be looking for that when I'm traveling. And when I, when you ask the question, like looking back anecdotally, I would say yes. Also, I mean, statistically, they talk about how much more people depend on each other in other countries. Um, you know, we have so much space here. We have so much wealth, most, a lot of people, and it's all relative, but that we can spread out and we don't live in our family homes. And when I think about when I, when my kids grow up, I want them to have a prop, a, a home or, or a, a condo or whatever next door to me. And that's just not predictable about how that's going to go. And in other countries, when we were in India, I went to visit one of my friends. Um, she was born in the U S her, most of her family lives in India and she connected us to them when we were visiting and their whole generations lived in this one building that had an open courtyard and everybody faced in. And to just think about the level of 
community and and connection that you have with people who you grow up with, you could only imagine that that would improve your mental health. Um, so I, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I observed it, but really it's sort of in retrospect that I, that I can answer and say, yeah, I think they do. Yeah. You know, there's such a huge emphasis on family and community in a lot of other parts of the world. So I think what you said there makes a lot of sense that leaning on community is it's not people are not as hyper individualistic as they are in the United States. So, yeah. and, you know, in, in speaking of traveling and also threads worldwide and, and the concept of threads worldwide, especially connecting with, you know, women or empowering female entrepreneurs, I want to know why women, why did you guys zero in on helping or giving a voice or giving opportunities to women entrepreneurs in these eight other countries that you work in? The main reason is this, this statistic, and it is that women reinvest 90% of their income back into their families and communities. Men, it's around 40%. And I wish I could remember who to quote, but it's a very popular quote. So you can go and look up that stat. I think it's even by maybe the UN or something like that. I used to know it, but, um, t but w men are about 40%. Now men, you know, sometimes you, you could think, well, they're spending on all these awful things sometimes, but not always. Um, and in fact, we went and, and we, we uh, observed this. So when we first started, we were working with um, two groups in Guatemala and one of the groups we thought had more women than than they actually ended up having. We've since completed that relationship because it was mostly men in the workshop. And so we went and we interviewed the men and it was really interesting. So they were saying, thank you so much for, for the work and for your orders. What we're doing with that is we're able to expand. We're able to buy new uh, machinery to make what we're making. Thank you so much for expanding. Whereas we're interviewing the women and they're saying, thank you so much for ordering. Your orders make a difference. I'm able to add eggs to my kids' meals. I can send my kids to school. And it's that level of, um, of, of investment back into their families that really makes a difference. And then we have so many stories about what happens when women get that money and how it really changes generationally. And then if you think about it back, you know, we've, we've, as evolved as a species, you know, men were out there, you know, expanding us. They were the reason we went and went West and we were the reason that they got on boats and, and, and discovered all over around the world and good. Thank you. Yay. We expanded and we, we, you know, to some detriment expanded a little bit too, too far and too fast, but but that's not what we think is needed. We really think that what is needed is turning into the families and turning into community and investing in each other. And so that's the reason. And um, we've seen it over and over and over again, what happens when women earn an income along with the voice that they get. You mentioned their voice. Um, they get a voice and get a, a level of, of respect and partnership if they're in a marriage from their husband. That's not typical in a lot of the cultures. Um, women, particularly in Ecuador and in Guatemala, share about how they're no longer in abusive relationships because they actually are bringing money to the table and seen as valuable, which there's a whole, you know, crappy side of that, that that's what it takes. But it, it does in some of these, in some places, especially when money is so, um, so scarce. So not only are you an entrepreneur, um, you're, I think there's a specific word for it. Um, is it a social, I think I wrote it down. Yes. Social impact entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're a social impact entrepreneur, which is a lot of work because you're, you know, it's on a global scale that you're you're doing your work. So I just want to know, um, you said a lot of things there about empowering women and just making sure that they have the necessary tools and um, resources to make a living for themselves and potentially get out of very toxic situations. Um, so I know that you consider your company a fair trade 
company, correct? What does it mean to be a fair trade company and how are you able to, to balance doing work on a global scale and partnering with women in all these different countries? Yeah, so we are part of the Fair Trade Federation and you can look them up. I think it's, well, just Google Fair Trade Federation. Um, there's that organization and then there's one called World Fair Trade Organization. And there are overriding bodies that you have to become a part of to show that you're really, um, well, that you're part of, or that you're using fair trade principles. So there are nine principles. Um, but the three that I talk about the most are that there's no child labor in any of our products, that there's um, healthy working conditions and safe working th conditions. And then third, that our partners are paid fairly and paid on time which means that we're paying them what they ask. It's a livable wage and there's a lot that goes into this. So it, they, you know, one of the things that they consider when giving us their pricing is what does it take to, to live, to have medical, um, um, and, you know, not insurance, but like coverage um, for transportation, all of these things that actually go into living a life that goes into making our products and to pricing our products. And then they come to us with the price and we don't negotiate. The only thing that we might say is <coughs> if it's too high, excuse me, if it's too high, we might say, okay, we can't do that. What would it take to get it into this price range? So we're not asking them to lower the price without them reducing the amount of labor or material that it would, that it would um, adjust it. So, uh, so that's really important to us. And that's the whole supply chain. So we have some products that are made from seeds. Um, we have some products that are made from bullet casings. Everybody who's involved in, in terms of harvesting the seeds, drying the seeds, dyeing the seeds, every part of that process, they're being paid fairly along the way. And so when you think about it, though, this is what sort of shocks me awake is like, wow, how cool. That's so great that that exists. But what about all the other products that we're using every day that don't use those principles? They're not saying anything like, oh, this and this is made from slave labor. But a lot of times it is if people aren't, if companies aren't intentionally going out and making sure that the, that the factories are great. We don't even work with factories, but that the villages are working great, whatever, whatever part along the supply chain, there's probably something off there. And then especially, you know, if you think about, you know, back before I started Threads, I heard myself saying this too, but you know, as women, you need people always, you know, if they compliment you, you can't just say thank you, right? You have to tell the story, right? Like, oh, thank you. I got it here. Oh, thank you. I got it for a gift. Oh, thank you. I got it on sale. You just, we just do, which is another reason, by the way, that I love that we sell jewelry because then when women compliment our jewelry, now our customers have something interesting to share, educational to share about where these are made. But I digress. So if you go back and, and I'm saying, hey, Jumi, wow, I love your I love your sweater. It's so pretty. Thank you. What I would say, too, is thank you. I got it for like $12 at Target. But if you stop and think about that now, when you hear people say that, and if the price sounds too low, it is. And who's not being paid? It's not Target. It's not Walmart. They're getting their money. So where is that money coming off of? And oftentimes it is the, the people who spend all their time creating that product. So I don't even know what question I'm answering because I'm going off so much, but this is something I'm so passionate about. And it's something that I've really taken to heart and something that's changed in my life, you know, how I shop. I, in the last eight years, I think I've brought, bought now four things that were new. And this is for my kids too. And we're in a good position where people are able to pass things down to us. I shop secondhand, so much more fun that way. But um, I'm just something I'm really, really passionate about that we're looking at where are we spending our money as a very influential uh, country where we can spend our, our money. It makes a difference in the world if we're starting to pay attention. But what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> no, you answered it because okay. I, I, I wanted to know why, you know, social impact entrepreneurship. Yeah. And I think you answered that so well, because I think a lot of times when we think about business, it's about profit, 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 generating as much profit as possible. And why I respect the work that you're doing, it's, yeah, profit is involved, but it's it's about empowerment. It's about equity. It's about fairness. And I think that that's important because as we, you know, do businesses, like you said, like you said, a lot of these companies going to different countries and literally exploit the people, exploit the natural resources. And I think it's important that we 
have a more fair, equitable, and ethical way of doing business. And it seems like that's what you're doing, which I really respect. And I also wanted to know, um, how are you able to do this work while also being a mom and a wife, right? Because I assume you probably have to travel to a lot of these different countries in which get you to. work with all. Sorry? Get to travel. Yes. Get, yes. You get yeah. to travel to yeah. a lot of these amazing countries, which I wanted to ask you, by the way, what are, what are those countries? But how are you able to balance entrepreneurship, especially the type of work that you're doing, and also being, you know, a mom, wife, friend, daughter, et cetera? Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's a good question. And I mentioned earlier that I'm really focusing on on my mental health and all and all of that in the last and my pace of things in the last 18 months, um, because it's not something I've had a good perspective on the whole time. Um, before COVID, um, we were on this really great trajectory where we were growing fast. And then with COVID, everything stopped because everything that we do is in person. So women will host get togethers with their friends where we come and we share about the jewelry, share about the artisans. And we really did that intentionally because we want this to be out in community and we want to be having fair trade warriors all over the place sharing about about this. And so women can start to think about, because women make the most of the, the purchasing decisions, start to think about, well, oh, I see fair trade bananas and they're 19 more cents a pound than these non-fair trade. But I learned about that at that threads gathering. I'm going to buy the fair trade bananas. Like we want that kind of conversation and ripple happening. And in 2020, it all shut down. I mean, it, it just, you know, shut down. And those probably two years, two and a half years. I mean, I just was sweating through my clothes on a daily basis. Like, yes, we're social impact. And you, just like you mentioned, we need profit. We need to be able to make money to be able to pay for all the things that we have. And, um, and so it was very, very nerve wracking time. And I was working to the point where I was, I would only go to sleep almost when I got that, like, I don't know if you get this, but when I get really tired, I get nauseated a little bit. That's when I would go to sleep every night. And I would lay down in bed, just swirling for a while and finally fall asleep. And it just was not healthy. And um, I remember it was July, it was July, not 2020. So July, 2022. And we were, I was outside of our office talking with my, my bestie business partner. And I just, I just remember looking at her and saying, I, I can't do this anymore. I just can't. I, my kids were even younger. My, my son was like probably two, two and a half. And I just, I was realizing that I was missing the most fun, squishy moments of their life where they want to be around me all the time. And I was missing that. And, and I was trying to squeeze them into my work life versus the other way. I really, they're, they're my number one and two number ones, I should say. And my husband, number one, number two, and then, and then workers after that, but that's not how I was prioritizing my time. And so I just had to stop and make, start making promises to people, specifically my husband about, I'm going to go to sleep earlier. You know, for, for me, I'm sort of a night owl. So like 10 30 is still earlier. I am not staying up this late anymore. I am working only these hours and just start making promises and, and sharing with people what I'm committed to. And, you know, you know, when you speak things out loud, they start to, to happen and so I've started doing that over and over and over and just prioritizing that. And now for, from time to time, like we just had our annual conference and I told my husband, I'm going to be up every night this week. It's just, it's just what I'm going to do. And that's okay from time to time, but it's not the norm. And, for, and I, and I really, I think it was like just making that declaration of, of, of bringing my priorities back into alignment that shifted my whole experience at our business. And we've been growing like me burning the midnight oil and being nauseatingly tired turns out didn't do anything more than what we're doing right now. I just get to prioritize my time in a better way. I love that you said that because I think sometimes if we're not stressing about something, we feel like we're not moving the needle. But actually what we need to do is step back and relax and, and rest yes. and actually to be able to move forward even faster. Do you know just made me think of this. Like I used to be scared of flying. And sometimes when 
I'm not scared. I think it's like a superstition, like, oh no, the plane's going to go down. Like as if my worry is what's keeping it up in the air. It's that illogical to compare to what you just said. Yes. Like, if I'm not stressing about this company, then it, it won't be growing. And that's not true. And I, that's something else I'm really working on. And I would give myself like a C minus on, you know, like how do I get into this ease and flow? But at least it's like on my radar to really, really focus on in 2024. This is my year, Jumi, to become yeah. the woman that I've always wanted to be. Like, this is it. I'm declaring it now. And yeah. you will, you will. Something that yeah. you mentioned that I wanted to ask you about is you, you said that you started making promises to your husband about, you know, taking better care of yourself and, and getting your rest. And, and something that you're very passionate about talking about is the notion of promises, promises versus boundaries. And I kind of want to get into that a little bit. What do you mean by people should start making more promises and not just focus on boundaries? Yeah, I... I think so boundaries and I haven't talked about it a lot. So I'm going to stumble a little bit here, but, but, you know, with boundaries, I think that that's a big term right now is, you know, set your boundaries and keep your boundaries and it, it's important. And, and I, I just, when I think about boundaries, it's sort of like, it, it is meant to keep people out. Right. And so like, like keep something at bay. And so I think when you say a boundary, it's like, this is me and you should not step over that boundary or otherwise X, Y, Z, whatever. There's some kind of almost consequence. And when I think about a promise, it's like, we're in this together. Like I'm saying, Jumi, I promise that this is how I'm going to show up in our relationship or even like a request, like Jumi, I'm going to show up this way. And I request that you show up this way in our relationship. So now it's like, we're co-creating it and you actually have a say in accepting my request or not. Whereas the other way, the only way that we can have a relationship in a boundary is you crossing it or not crossing it. But I don't know. What do you think about that? I actually really like that notion because boundaries seem so daunting for the person enforcing it and the person receiving it because it's like, <gasps> Oh my God, this is this is a hard line here. And you know, I can't cross it. It it adds some sort of tension to it. Not always, but a lot of times I think that's what comes with boundaries. But I like what you're saying about the promise thing, because it seems like you said co-creating. Both people kind of have like have a say in some sense to do better. And there's room to kind of adjust it. There's also room to adjust boundaries, but it, it feels less do or die. Yes. Um, <laughs> and there's something about upholding a promise. Yes. Then, and, then, yeah. And you're like accepting the promise or, or accepting the request or, or whatever. And then if you don't do it, like you have a say in it as well versus like you cross my boundary. Yes. Yeah. I like that. I think. Yeah, I, I, I do like that. It, it seems a little bit more collaborative. And if someone cannot, if you promise someone something and they cannot uphold their end of whatever promise they need to make back to you, then that's for the person or both parties to, to decide whether or not they can tolerate that. But I do like what you're saying about the promise thing. I, it's it's a new way of thinking about boundaries yeah. or looking at it from a different angle. I really like that. Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> you didn't stumble at all. Um, something else I wanted to ask you too is this um, whole idea about comparison. You obviously working as an entrepreneur, I'm sure this happens to a lot of people. We tend to kind of look at what other people are doing and how fast other people are growing. So have you ever struggled with comparing yourself to other people? And why do you think comparison is more of, why do you think it's important for people to use comparison to kind of be better rather than use it to kind of feel bad about themselves yeah, or put yeah, themselves yeah. down? Yeah. So you've really done your research. Um, so with the with that, I, I did a talk on using comparison as a guide to joy as opposed to the thief of joy. And I was just noticing, I was talking with one of my friends and I was noticing that when I was jealous of somebody or when I was comparing myself in a way that made me feel bad, it was when I really like looked back and like, like could, could break it down. 
I, I saw that I was only doing that with people that I admired something about. And, and it was in a way that I thought that I could or should be that way. So as compared to, for example, if I was talking to an ultra marathoner or a, you know, opera singer, I would only be, you know, amazed at them. I would only be enthralled at what they were doing and with curiosity, no comparison because I, I, I don't, I don't have the voice for an opera singer. I have no desire to be an ultra marathoner. There's nothing to compare there. And so then when I looked at the people that I was comparing myself to, it was because I thought, oh, I could be that way. I should be that way. Now I know should's not a word that we want to use and all that. But when I looked at it, I was like, oh, it's because I think that I possibly could. So what could I do that actually has me take a step more towards what they have or who they are, or who they be in a world in the world or situation that would that would actually feed and have me expand myself in that way. And, and <clears throat> just recently, like as in Sunday, so this is hot off the presses in terms of my breakthroughs. I was um, in this, um, at our conference, we had this woman come in and speak about quantum jumping. Jumi, she's somebody that you should interview. Her name's Allie Duncan. Oh my gosh, she's amazing. I can introduce you. But she um, was did this meditation with us. And one of the things that she was talking about is going towards joy and going towards gratitude in life and pleasure in life. And I was thinking about, all of a sudden in this meditation, my two besties who I started this company with are some of the funniest people you've ever met. So fun, so funny, just met those magnetic personalities. And sometimes when I was around them, I would feel not that like, oh, I'm the boring one. Oh, I'm the lame, right? Something like that. And then I didn't want to feel that way because they're my besties. And okay, so you can see the whole spiral. And I got in this meditation, oh, being around people like that, and they're not the only ones in my life, but like being around people like that, it's, it's me going towards pleasure, going towards joy. The fact that I've attracted those kind of people in my life is actually a testament to me and that I'm doing what brings me joy and pleasure in life by surrounding myself. So that was just another slice that I got as of Sunday on looking at comparison and how how to actually not have it beat us down because we're going to have it trying to avoid comparing ourselves and, you know, you're good. Everybody run your own race and it's the, the, the thief of joy. Well, good. Yeah. How much is that done for us? Not a lot. So how can we actually sort of leverage comparison to focus us on what's really most important to us? I love everything that you just said. And as you were talking, actually, I think you said the word expand and there's this, woman that I listen to. Her name is Lacey Phillips, I believe. She has a podcast called Expanded. She's like a manifestation expert. And one of her lessons or tips when it comes to manifestation is that whenever you see someone doing something that you want to be able to do, or you like the way they're doing it, they're your expanders. They're basically showing you that whatever you want is possible. And I was like, oh my God, that's so true. I've, I've always kind of had that in my mind is like, you know, whenever I see someone who has the number one podcast in a specific space that, you know, looks like me and, you know, all of that stuff, I'm like, oh, okay, I can do this. They're, they're my expander. They're showing me that this reality is possible. And like you said, too, with your besties in your life, with how amazing they are is really a testament to you because your energy had to match their energy. And if you're saying that they are these wonderful people, it only means that you're just as wonderful as they are. So I love everything that you just said there. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, it, our expanders, I love that. They they're showing us that that we can that that's possible. We can do that. I love yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. So I have to ask, because I had a conversation with um a guy recently, I'm forgetting his name, Brett Mag Magpyong. And he is a coach that specializes in purpose, right? And he says purpose can be defined with three Ps, passion, priorities, um, and principles. Do you feel like with Threads Worldwide right now, you are working in your purpose? So passion, principles, and priorities. Yes. 
if I define it by that, I would say yes, except for, I'm really looking, except for like what I talked about with my kids. My kids are my priorities and they're not in the business yet, but I am thinking about ways. My daughter's seven. And so I'm thinking about what my, my son's four and a half, but, but my daughter, I'm thinking about ways to incorporate more kids into what we're doing. Um, and, and I think when that happens, like the seas will part and I will ascend, it will be like the, the perfect company when all of that comes together. And, um, except for that, I would say, yes. I mean, I get to work in a community of women who are big hearted, you know, mission driven up to something women and willing to grow themselves. Uh, this last weekend we were at our conference and it was all about just stretching ourselves and growing ourselves and getting out of that comfort zone. And that's who I get to spend my time with. And, you know, we've had multiple opportunities to shift the business model. Direct sales doesn't always have the best reputation, you know, so not often, but sometimes people say, isn't that a pyramid scheme? It's like, no, pyramid schemes are illegal. And this is the best way to have women involved and really to have everyone paid based on their talents, you know, not based on where did they interview well or, or whatever, you know, I, I don't know, per, certain, certain person has to leave the company first. It really is the best way for women to be able to be in community. And so we've had so many different times to, to change the model. And I just keep coming back to it and thinking, I do not want to do this on my own. If this model goes away, I think we'll just, we would, shut down threads because that is the model. Like, yes, it is about the women that we work with, but it's so much, so much of it and so much more shifting towards what women here in the U S get, you know, women need a little bit extra money. Women are, we're chronically feeling disconnected. Like we talked about earlier. I just read the study 85% of women or no, sorry, of people, 85% of Americans say that they are generally satisfied with life. Which at first I thought, well, that's a lot more than I thought. Like that's high. But then when I thought about generally satisfied, that's like saying fine. That's like, how's work? Fine. How's your marriage? Fine. How are your kids? Fine. Like how's life? It's fine. When only 20% said that they're passionate about work. And I want to change that number. I want to find, I want to be a place where women can come in any way that they want to plug in and be led by their passions instead of this trajectory, this life of fine. And so, yes, I would say that it has all of it. It has my principles. It has my, my passion and 90% of my priorities. <laughs> I mean, 90% is huge. So yeah. I'm, I'm happy that you're working in your purpose and, and, you know, purpose looks different, different stages in life and we can have multiple purposes running at the same time. But I was just, I want, it's nice to know that you're passionate about the work that you're doing and you're making change with it. So in the 10 years that you've been doing this business, what, things have you learned about yourself? So for example, in podcasting now for the last two, three years, I've learned that I'm able to be consistent in something that I really enjoy doing. If you had asked me that prior to podcasting, I probably would have been a lot harder on myself and thought, oh, I don't, you know, stick with something. But I've learned that I can stick with something. Um, I learned that I love connecting with people and having profound conversations. So in the 10 years of, of you doing this work, what are some things that you've learned about yourself that you didn't know before? Well, can I ask you a question back first is yeah. how has that trickled into other areas of your life? Like the being consistent, that's such an incredible thing to be, first of all, that's, I mean, well, there's some quote, I think it's maybe Woody Allen, that 80% of life is showing up. Okay. So that's huge. But then it's also like where to know yourself as somebody who's consistent. How has that affected other areas of your life? Wow, that's an amazing question. So it's affected my self-esteem. Um, I have grown so much in that self-esteem space, in that self-love space, because I've shown myself that I can show up and honor the things that I'm passionate about. It's also trickled into health and wellness. So making a promise to myself and staying consistent with 
working out and trying to eat better, all of that, it's just been a snowball effect in that as well, being consistent and showing up in my friendships, in my family relationships, keeping my word, right? When I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. So it's really affected my relationships in a positive way and my relationship to self has dramatically increased. So that's such a beautiful question because I had never thought about it until you just said that just now. Yes. And now you can claim that for yourself. Like that's who you yes. are yeah. now from podcasting. Yeah. It's so it's amazing. Cool. It's yes. so amazing. Yeah. It's really cool. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, I love that. I love it. I love it. Um, so, so for me, I would say, um, I think I've been tested, um, with my perseverance and, um, my ability to focus. I do not always, and I do know that I can focus and get things done. Um, I've also learned that I really, I've learned that I love being around people. I, I don't know if I wouldn't have said that before, but just more and more making that choice and being so lit up when people win themselves that again, I think that this model is the perfect match for my personality of what I don't, I don't, I don't love being in the limelight and, and I love being in the limelight if it's me shouting somebody else out, cheering somebody else on, it's just more comfortable. And so I, one of the roles that I say that I play is I fan people's flames around me. Like I want other people around me to do well. And I've, I've consistently um, seen myself do that sort of organically. And again, I don't know that I thought I would have said that before. It's it's fun when you can see and and claim that I had a coach who said this like when you can claim something for yourself then that's that's who you become and that and that's who you start showing up as consistently in other places like you talked about and so claiming that for myself even publicly here with you it it sort of makes it more and more true yeah yeah I love that I think there are not a lot of people who well I don't want to be dramatic but I you don't run into a lot of people who don't want the spotlight for themselves necessarily and want to champion other people just because of the society we live in. You know, I think we don't feel like we're successful. We don't feel like we're doing the right thing or reaching a certain level unless we're in front of the limelight. But I love that you have found that you really like uplifting people and, you know, making and highlighting other people's light. I think that's a profound and amazing quality to have as a person. Yeah. And on tr truthfully, like you just said, I think it's probably also compensating for something of, I, you know, uh, I don't know what the term is, imposter syndrome or like, um, mm. not good. Enough. You know, it's, it's, it's like compensating in some way, I think like, don't look at me. I'm not great, but look over there. They're, you know, they're great. Oh, um, that's an interesting perspective. So do you, I, do you still struggle with imposter syndrome? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I just, I, I, in my life, I've been put in various leadership positions. Like one I can think about in volleyball, I was asked to be the team captain on one of these teams. And I just remember being like, I am full of it. I'm going to go into the huddle and ask people to do a certain cheer or pump people up. Like, who am I to do that? And I think that that's not something that I, it's not something I've fully quieted yet. And so it's something, yeah, that I, I work on of like what we have here is amazing. The community we have here is amazing. People want to participate in this, like go cheer it on. This is one of the reasons I'm awful at social media, which is a big thing I'm taking on in 2024. Of like, I need to start getting out there and sharing about what it is that we're doing. And it's just not, it's not natural. Like I want to share again, other people's posts or about my kids, but nothing about like, Look over here. Yeah. I, you know, I'm the same way, funny enough, which is ironic because I have a podcast. Yeah. Um, but I struggle with social media as well. And whenever I have to like post myself, I'm like, Ugh, cringe yes. in the sense yes. of like, I don't want people thinking, oh, here she comes again. Or who does she think she is? It's 
a lot of negative thoughts that are, are not true were meant to take up space. And I think a lot of women actually struggle with taking up space. So I'm with you. This is our year to take up space, Angela. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> We have to follow and all, we have all to, that stuff. Yeah, together. exactly. Yeah. We have to keep okay. each other accountable. Yeah. Okay, um, good. <laughs> this has been such a great conversation okay. with you. I enjoyed it so much. I always like to ask my guests for final words of wisdom. It could be about what we've been talking about or something completely different that you keep in your back pocket as you go through life. Yeah, I think just to go back to what we said, you know, looking where you can make promises and make requests of people where they have a chance to participate. Um, even when you were talking about your health and well and wellness and, and um, I don't know if you said something about what you were eating or if I just brought that into my mind of what, but like what kind of requests and promises can we make of ourselves around what we eat and we don't eat and when we work out and when we don't work out and things like that. Uh, I just think that's such a powerful structure. So I, that's one thing I just want to reflect on. And then when, when I was thinking about a quote um, there's, there's three quotes I love. One is by Tom Petty. And it doesn't apply anymore because he's now gone. But he said, I'm glad I'm getting older because at least I'm not dead. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I think about getting older, I'm like, well, that's true. At least let's age that way. That's one. The second one is in a song by the Eagles. And it says, you can see the stars, but still not see the light. And I don't know. There's something about it that for me, it's like you can start to see what's coming, but you really have no idea and just be open into that curiosity and expansiveness of what's possible. And then my final one is if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go together. And that's an African proverb, which is just so perfect for the work that we're doing about how do we bring more, more people in to what we're trying to do and how we're trying to spread, spread light around the world. I love all of those quotes. I'm a quote junkie. I'm always collecting quotes. So those are all so good. Where can people find you if they want to shop Thread Worldwide? And if you're also comfortable, um, one thing I wanted to touch on, but forgot to, I don't think I asked you, what countries do you source yeah. your products from? Yep. So I have to do it by continent. So we, we're in um, Ecuador, Bolivia, Guatemala, Uganda, Ethiopia, Vietnam, Indonesia, and India. Awesome. Yep. And people can shop from us at threadsworldwide.com. Uh, that's our Instagram. That's our Facebook. And then I'm on Instagram at Angela.threadsworldwide. So pretty easy to find. And awesome. I promise I'll start posting more. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I'm going to link all of that in the show notes. Thank you again for stopping by A Word to the Wise. Thank you so much, Jimmy. It was fun.